Now we'll have a short talk on social class and how that concept figures in the issue of human diversity in America. Social class is the basis for a lot of the structure of our society. There is this unspoken belief that we've talked about in other contexts during the course of the semester that the superior should control the inferior. Now this, of course, rests upon the fact that who is identified or which group is identified as superior depends a lot upon the group that is in control in society. Western religions and philosophies tend to support this notion of the superiority of certain groups. And this social arrangement is based upon the dominance and subordination in social class that, uh, that underlies the importance of social class and classism. Now, classism is, is another type of ism where the wealthy are privileged and they're given uh, preferred status over the poor, the working class, and, and also the middle class because of the power that this group is able to achieve, the elite are able to stigmatize the lower class and keep them at a disadvantage. Compared to racism and sexism, sometimes classism is, is uh, relatively easy to not notice. And it, I believe it's because we often confuse classism and the issues related to social class and economic class with issues related to race and gender, when many times those issues are much more closely related, related to class. The fact that it is difficult to see then gives us this notion that our system is not a caste system as other cultures such as India has had in the past where wherever you're born into a, a certain class, you remain in that class. Instead, in America, we believe that anyone can improve their lot and climb the economic ladder through effort and work and achievement. And this is something that the upper classes are believed to use to keep the lower classes satisfied. This notion that somehow they can get to improve their situation in life through individual effort. So this thinking really is is the basis for the blaming of the poor for poverty and is really a part of our, our traditional social thinking in America. Because of this, the differences that exist between groups really means more than simple differences. For instance, women are seen as deficient and inferior to men. People of color at times are classified as deviant and assigned pathological labels, whether it's by the justice system or the mental health system. And the elderly are generally seen as incompetent and a burden. So you can see how this tends to justify racism and sexism and ageism and all other forms of oppression. And sadly, these perceptions become a part of our nation's social policy and ultimately get woven into the social welfare system in the nation. Now, generally, in, at least in a, a capitalist society, we believe that social class is determined by one's occupation, income, and education. The status one receives based upon these three areas often is contradictory. Take college professors, for instance. The status that is awarded to a college professor based upon the occupation itself, the privilege and prestige that goes with that is rather high. And yet the income level of those individuals is really very mediocre in comparison to many other fields of, of professionalism. Another example might be the oil field worker in Alaska who may not have the highest amount of education compared to other workers and yet receives an income much higher than most other workers in the state. A lot of times we don't discuss class in, 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 our, in our society because we want to believe, we want to tell ourselves that we're all equal and that really what we have is based upon, upon our work, upon our effort. But when you're in a higher social class, you get such things as privilege and freedom from oppression. You get the ability to establish laws because a lot of times those individuals either run for office and write the laws or fund the people who are in the position to create laws. And ultimately, because of this capacity to define what is normal and what is acceptable in a society, these individuals are defining what is normal and what is considered deviant. And once again, this is a way that the upper social classes can keep the lower social classes in line. The poor makes up about 15% of our population. Now, most of those are children, but only about 30% of the poor are chronically poor. Most individuals who are poor go in and out of poverty at different times. 
African American, Latino, Native American, and other oppressed groups are often represented in disproportionate numbers among the poor. And the level of inequality between the classes at this time is increasing in our society. The gap between the wealthy and the poor is ever increasing. And some persons are actually experiencing a downward mobility in our society today. You'll often hear individuals say that the younger generation today may be the first generation to do more poorly than their parents did economically in America. And you can see here that your belonging to an oppressed group has a very great impact upon your chances of being poor, whether you're a female head of household, a Latino or black man or woman, and a black female head of household, as compared to being a white man or woman. Quite a bit of disparity in the, in the poverty rates or the chances of being poor. In an economy that is based on social class, education is seen to be the key to advancement in the culture. That is the belief that the more one pursues education and gets more and more degrees and increased specialization in different areas, the more likely that individual is going to be able to become wealthier and more successful in society. The education institution is actually the gatekeeper for professional credentialing of its members and in fact is oftentimes considered to be the gatekeeper to success altogether in, in our culture. But the educational system in our society treats students from the upper socioeconomic groups much differently than those in the working class group. In 2019, for instance, the scandal involving the rich and famous buying their children's way into universities, elite universities, seemed to shock the nation, although legacy admissions to universities, that is, where children of graduates of universities or children of famous and wealthy donors to universities being admitted regardless of their scores is nothing new, but sometimes our society seems to present these problems to us as though it's recently discovered, even though these problems have been going on all along. Later in the semester, you'll be looking at an article by Jonathan Kozel that was written a couple of decades ago called Savage Inequalities, which documents the difference in educational environments of lower socioeconomic students and wealthy students in America. Because of this, the, wealth, the working class is relegated to be dependent upon a poor job market with low-paying jobs, few benefits, and little chance for advancement. It's important to remember here is this, this graphic suggests that, that really the goal of capitalism is always to produce profit. A successful capitalist makes money, and that profit is attained at the expense of the toil of the working class, of the poor, and of the middle class. Capitalism is not set up to take care of the needs of everyone. A successful capitalist is one who makes greater profit. It's important to, to keep that in mind when we consider why it is that there's a growing disparity between the wealthy and the poor in this nation. When you are working with an individual in their ecosystem, there are as many as six different environmental subsystems identified here that contribute to the social well-being of, of members of a community. And these include their economic and basic needs, the educational and training systems in their environment, the judicial and legal system, which oftentimes treats members of social class in differing ways, the health, safety, and social service systems available in the client's environment, what voluntary associations are available to the client, and then the affectional support systems, that is family and those who are friends who are close to those individuals. When these institutions and subsystems fail to meet the needs of the members of the community and of the individuals, problems begin to arise. And since our work is generally performed at the point of contact between the client and these systems or other persons in these systems, then what we do is we look to identify the problems in working. We, we look to identify the problems that our clients experience in interacting with these systems and then work to find ways to resolve those issues. And discrimination is considered a potential problem in each of these systems because Social class members are treated differently depending upon what, what social class the individual belongs to. Herbert Gans tells us that we cannot separate the social construction that we know as race from social class. He writes about how various immigrant populations at first described separately have come to be seen as white as the economic standing has improved over the course of time. Industrialists, for instance, he writes, didn't want to employ African Americans, and so they actually encouraged the immigration of European peasants to, to fill the jobs 100 or 
150 years ago, swarthy Southern Europeans such as my own ancestors and Guinea Italians. These are the names that were given to the individuals arriving, even though today these individuals are seen as white Americans. Because as as the subsequent generations of those immigrants did better, Gans says apparently their skin began to look lighter and they became visibly middle class and they were seen as fully white, even though their their skin biologically was unchanged, but as he says, socially blanched. In around the 19th century, there was concerns about the yellow hordes of Asians overwhelming America. This was after they were invited here to work on establishing the railroad during the gold rush and the need to move our, our nation west. Once that was achieved, they really were not welcomed any longer, were actually excluded from admission to our nation for some time. But now they're sometimes thought of as what what Gans refers to as honorary whites. They they will soon turn into a new set of white ethnics. And these are the successful ones. These are the ones who are getting higher education and are outperforming even, even the white majority in terms of education and economic status. But the poorer members of the Asians who have immigrated to the United States, these Eastern and South- Southeastern Asians may not be so privileged in the long run. Today, Hispanics are seen as the equivalent of the swarthy race, and our leadership has certainly seen to it that they are seen as invaders to our to our nation and our economy. But uh, Gans believes that just like other groups that have come into America, uh, subsequently their children will be seen as whitening as they become more and more middle class. There are some thinkers who, who believe that our society is going to evolve into a three-tiered system uh, of social class based upon race, and that is those who are the Northern European whites, then the honorary whites, and these are all these groups we're talking about here, and then the, the dark-skinned individuals who this thinker that I, that and I'm sorry, I don't have the, the name of the individual, but this, this uh, social philosopher believed that they're going to find it very difficult to to climb out of their exclusion from participation in society. And we'll be talking about this in a minute. Anytime that newcomers become competition for the resources, and that's usually jobs, then they are seen as threats to white majority individuals. Now, Gans explains that the African-American experience is different. The only population whose racial features are not automatically perceived differently with upward mobility are African-Americans. Those who are affluent and well-educated remain as visibly black to whites as before. His thoughts are that the inability of the white majority to perceive successful African Americans differently is because of the white political economy that essentially relies upon African Americans to provide the anchor to the class structure with a permanently lower class population. Now there's ample food for thought there when you consider this possibility and you look at the overpopulation of minority members in the lower socioeconomic groups. When you think about it in terms of this and the economic implications of of the separation of classes and the separation of racial groups like this, you can begin to see how we really need to talk about oppression and how oppression actually works to keep minority individuals in a lower position in our society. And, And these undercasts aren't unique to America. They're not unique in our time, as we talked about a, a slide or two back, throughout our history, we have rejected immigrants even as, as we have welcomed them. Perhaps we first welcome them, then we reject them once we no longer need their labor. Once they be- begin to improve their economic status, they become more competition for us and we're less welcoming of those individuals. The undercasts exist here all around the world, as is suggested here with the gypsies and the untouchables and indigenous persons and other cultures. These factors really restrain African-Americans from competing for resources that would enable them to achieve economic success and higher income in America. Mantusios, in his piece, Media Magic, Making Class Invisible, writes that while we believe that we live in an egalitarian society, we are in fact the most highly stratified society in the industrialized world. And the media works to advance and support inaccurate perceptions that we hold about the poor, the wealthy, and the middle class in the different ways that these groups are portrayed in television and in different forms of of media that we are exposed to. As a result of all of this, the middle class begins to see itself not victimized by those who are wealthy, 
but victimized by those who are less affluent. This is the trick that politicians are using today to garner votes, capitalizing and, and playing on, on this perception that it is the poor that are causing our economic problems. It is the poor that is dragging down our economy and thus creating all of the problems that the working class and the middle class experience, not the wealthy. So they drive home these points that the poor drive up the costs of maintaining the welfare rules. This focus upon denying food stamps unless people work for food stamps, denying Medicaid coverage unless individuals are working. This is an example of this. And this is rampant all across the nation, particularly in areas that are traditionally considered to be red states. Minorities commit crimes against the middle class. An example, of course, is Donald Trump's pronouncement at the time that he announced his candidacy about how Mexicans aren't sending us, or Mexico isn't sending us its, uh, its best citizen, but uh, they're sending us criminals and rapists. This is an example of how politicians use these fears that we have in America. The middle class, largely uninformed individuals have for their own safety and use it to garner votes and support in, in their own campaigns. The working class is seen as greedy and driving companies out of business and driving prices up. Unions have become very unpopular with many of our red state politicians in particular, and even in some blue states for that matter. Unions which, you know, are the, the heart and soul of the working class protection that the worker has against the ravages of capitalism. Little by little, slowly but surely, leadership in the nation is pushing public perception to believe that unions are hurtful to the economy and drive this effort to dismantle unions and drive down union membership, which has in fact fallen dramatically in the last few decades. But at the same time, the media ignores things like the subsidies of the rich, an example, of course, of the recent tax cuts in the Trump administration and in prior administrations as well. The crimes of corporate America, many of which go unpunished in September 2019, for instance, the Purdue Pharma pharmaceutical company settled a large case involving many different states about the death of individuals from opioids, which they pushed upon an unsuspecting America over the course of two or three decades. The individuals who have carried this out, at, as, at least as of the time of the recording of this lecture, no one's even talking about punishment for them, just a fine. All sorts of policies grow from all of this that create havoc for the economic well-being of America, of middle America, with the efforts to support the needs of the wealthy or the desires and the wishes of the wealthy who essentially remain in power or support those who have political power in America. Social class is something to consider in our in our discussion of diversity issues in America, blends very much in with race and with economics and is an area that is worth further thought as the semester goes along. Thanks.